fortunate to have with us our immediate past president, Dr. Sri Dr. Wee, to share on the topic, Loving Kindness, the Divine Act of Loving. Dr. Sri Dr. Victor Wee is a founding member and immediate past president of the Buddhist Gem Fellowship. He is the Honorary Secretary of the International Buddhist Confederation, a world body for Buddhists based in Delhi. He started studying Buddhism at the Sekyangi Dharma School and has taught Dharma to Buddhist groups and spoke at international and local Buddhist conferences. Dato Sri leads Metta Meditation at BGF for the last 23 years and is also a pioneer in English Buddhist music. He has composed many Dharma songs in English and recorded five albums with the Wayfarers. For his work in Buddhism, he has given several awards, including the 10 Outstanding Malaysian Youth in 1992 and the World Buddhist Outstanding Leader Award in 2013 by the World Fellowship of Buddhist Youth based in Bangkok. He is currently the professor of, at the School of Hospitality and Tourism at Taylor's University. His career with the Malaysian government includes serving as the Secretary General of the Ministry of Tourism and the Chairman of Tourism Malaysia. He has also worked as Senior Director at the Economic Planning Unit, the Prime Minister's Department, and was Chairman to the Program Committee for the United Nations World Tourism Organization during the years 2007 to 2012. He received his bachelor's degree in economics at the University of Malaya, master's degree in sociology at Brown University, USA, and PhD in economics at Bristol University in the United Kingdom. So over to you, Dato Sri. Thank you very much, Brother Bobby, for the very kind introduction. And brothers and sisters in the Dharma, it's nice to have you following this program, uh, this talk on Sunday morning. As you know, we used to have it in the, at VGS, now with the our uh, CMCO. We have to do it online. Uh, but uh, the advantage of doing online is that we can actually reach out to people so out of Kuala Lumpur and the Selangor, which is a real advantage. Uh, this morning's talk is really something really important because it talks about how uh, we interact how we influence and how we experience the world. As you know, in the very first opening two stanzas from the Dhammapada, uh, it says that mind is the forerunner of all good as well as e evil states. Yeah? So mind is chief. As a chief, it moves forward. It is first to move. And mind made are they. Our experiences are being created by the mind. If a person were to act with an impure mind, then he will experience suffering that will follow him like the wheels follow the ox that pulls the cart. But if a person were to act or speak with a pure mind, happiness will be with him and happiness will follow him like the shadow, like his shadow that never leaves him. So this is something important because we're going to talk about loving kindness, about matter. How can we shape ourselves? How can we condition our mind so that we begin to have good experience for ourselves? And how can we use matter to interact with the world? So this morning's talk is Meta, the divine act of love. Um, The Buddha spoke on how we can develop excellent, lofty, or sublime states of mind. Our states of mind could actually rise up instead of being nitty gritty, instead of uh, dwelling in uh, you know, the past of grouses and uh, unsatisfactory states, of being filled with frustration, of anger, of um, unhappiness. It is possible for us to elevate our mind. In fact, we can make our mind like the lofty, uh, like Brahma, you know. So uh, the Buddha has introduced what we call the Brahma Viharas. And through this practice, we can almost keep our mind like the Brahma, 
our mind could almost be God-like, or we could almost be like dwelling in divine abodes, right? So you don't have to, you can experience the uh, heaven on earth, actually. Now, what is a Brahma Vihara? There are four aspects of Brahma Vihara, of this divine, universal, and unselfish love. You have loving kindness, which is called metta. Uh, loving kindness is also universal friendliness. And, uh, you have compassion, which is called karuna. So loving kindness, that you, that you, that you read it to all, that you have a mind of loving kindness. But when the person or when the being that you interact with is facing some difficulties and facing some suffering, then the other part of loving kindness becomes compassion. It becomes karuna. Uh, the third aspect is what we call sympathetic joy. Or this is rejoicing in the happiness of others, or mudita. This is when we see success being achieved by other people. We, instead of begrudging that success, we rejoice. And this is called mudita, or sympathetic joy. And finally, to have a mind of equanimity, or upekka, um, as we become uh, more, uh, uh, as we grow in our wisdom, we realize that there are ups and downs in this world. And in these states, our minds become, because of this understanding, because of this wisdom. These are really different aspects of love. Uh, different aspects of metta, uh, metta, karuna, mudita, and upekka. The Brahma, uh, the Buddha called this Brahma Vihara or divine abiding. And that is, if you can maintain any of these divine mental states for just a moment, and in that moment, you will live as the highest gods, as the Brahma Devas. Okay, so that is why it's called Brahma Vihara. Now, we have the potential to abide in these divine states by tapping the inner wealth within. And when we do this, this is more valuable than any other riches that we can have. Uh, very often, our mind, if you don't uh, pay your attention to the mind, the mind tends to uh, grovel down. It tends to go down. But it is possible to elevate uh, our mind to experience the divine states because this is something that is fine within us. For instance, you may say, is it possible for me to have uh, divine states? For instance, we can look out at parents, for instance. Many of you are parents, and you practice a Brahma Vihara. Uh, you know, so you basically you have matter for your, for your children, yeah? just loving kindness for them. But if one of your child falls sick, or is facing difficulty, then you have the feeling of compassion. You just want to help them out. You do not want them to suffer so much, yeah? And you try to see what you can do in order to elevate their suffering. And that's called compassion. That is when loving kindness becomes, turns into compassion. But when your uh, child becomes very successful, maybe he performs very well in sports or in his uh, scholastic achievements, you re re rejoice, you rejoice if he's being honored if it's, uh, you know, has achieved success, you rejoice. And that is what we call mudita. And later on, when he grows up, and when he gets married and have his own children, you don't interfere with his family life. Uh, it's just a like hands off, and you, this is what you call upeka. You enjoy your grandchildren, but you do not get involved, uh, you know, trying to micromanage, you know, how they raise their children. So this is what we call having uh, four Brahma Viharas, which parents uh, uh, practice. I think all of us experience this to some way, uh, uh, some measure or other. Now, love doesn't have to depend on ideal circumstances. Very often, uh, our love is almost transactional. That is, uh, we uh, give love, provided we receive love. You know, it is like tit for tat or quid pro quo. But in the case of matter, it doesn't have to depend on ideal circumstances. We can learn how to recognize, to awaken, and to develop this potential until this potential naturally remains in the heart. So that is our goal. Because the path, the Buddhist path, is the path of cultivation, of development. So we are saying that we are not really um, completely satisfied with what we are right now. 
we would like to cultivate ourselves. And it is possible to awaken this potential within ourselves so that we can actually develop this loving potential so that it remains naturally in our hearts. So when we cultivate Brahma Viharas, we keep love in all our encounters, no matter whom you meet or how challenging the circumstances is. You maintain your loving kindness. Uh, there was a story during the Buddha's time about how there was this uh, lady in this village, and she's well known for her generosity. Everybody praised this lady uh, you know, for her composture, how she carries herself. Uh, but she has a servant, a maid, who feels that uh, people are basically uh, you know, overrating <laughs> the mistress. So what the maid did one day was to wake up late. And of course, uh, normally the maid would have to prepare everything. And when she wakes up late, the uh, mistress was not happy. She was commenting, why are you late and all that. So, and every day something happens, you know, the maid uh, purposely do certain things and it becomes worse and worse. And eventually it was so bad that the mistress took some hot water and poured it over the maid and the maid runs out and say, you see, everybody says that my mistress is wonderful, but look at her. I think many people are like that. Uh, if they have not been pressured, they are not put under stress, you may think that, oh, they're really nice. And actually see the true nature of them. That work together with a loving heart. And it is, it is something that's not entangled with selfishness, that is thinking, oh, about me, about I, right? Of narcissism, looking at ourselves, oh, how do I look? Uh, what do people think of me? It is not entangled with fear, because with fear, uh, then you would have, uh, you would think, you know, how could I protect myself with aversion or with craving? And uh, the practice of the four Brahma Viharas is considered by the Buddha as the greatest of all worldly merit. So if you like to accumulate merit, practicing the Brahma Viharas is the greatest of all worldly merit. And if we just practice this uh, mental states alone without developing the penetrative insight of Vipassana, this can actually lead to the highest heavens. And in the Anguttara Nikaya 11.16, uh, where the benefits of metta practice is enumerated. There are altogether 11 benefits. And the last benefit is rebirth in a Brahma plane of existence. Now, I will go through these 11 benefits of metta uh, later in the talk. So this is to say that when we uh, get our minds involved uh, practicing the Brahma Viharas, we are indeed uh, creating the greatest of all worldly merits. In fact, they say that it takes as long as an elephant takes to flap his ears, if you practice metta just for that instance alone, you will be actually accumulating, accumulating you know, boundless merits. If this practice is coupled with the cultivation of insight, yeah, in fact, that will be in fact much better uh, because we know that heavenly existence, although it can last a long time, it is really filled with so much happiness. It's not something that will, that will, be, that will be permanent. Right? I like uh, what is being taught in some other uh, re religious traditions. In the case of Buddhism, we say that even though heavenly births can lead you, you know, uh, very long periods of existence, it is not an existence that will be permanent. It is an impermanent state. So eventually, where the merits wear up, then uh, you would have to come down to some other uh, uh, planes of uh, uh, existence. Now, what is matter? The key Brahma Vihara quality to practice is metta, because I was saying that karuna, which is compassion, mudita, which is appreciative joy, and upeka, all different aspects of this metta. So let us just talk about, we just focus on uh, metta. Now metta is what we consider to be a universal, a boundless love for all beings without discrimination. It means that you have this universal friendliness to all beings. And you don't discriminate, you don't say, oh, this is close to me, that is that this belongs to me, and uh, you know, this is connected to me, and those are not connected to me. You don't have that discrimination. It is boundless, it is open, it is universal. Its natural function is to promote friendliness and the disappearance of ill will. 
And in fact, as an analogy, the Buddha have used the analogy of the mother with her only child. And you know, when the mother has, has her only child, only one child, she would in fact be prepared even to sacrifice her life for the sake of the child. She'll do everything for the child. Not because the child can do anything in return for her. It is just that she wants the child to be happy. She doesn't want the child to suffer. The happiness of the child is her own happiness. So this is the love of a mother for the child. And this is what we call the quality of metta, loving kindness. It's not transactional. It's not like how much uh, the child could give her in return. And that is why she's given her love in a kind of a measured manner. It is not like that. Metta is like the love of the mother for the child. It is not transient love or romantic love. A romantic love is that two young people getting together, getting infatuated. In fact, I think um, uh, the scientist, neuroscientist tells us that when people are romantically in love, they're like slightly mad <laughs> because uh, certain secretions in their, in their brains will, will, will uh, color the, the way they look at the world. You know? So they get a complete, a rosy picture of, the, of, of, of life. Uh, but eventually when they settle down, when they get married, they find that actually life is not like that. You know, the reality really comes in, yeah. <laughs> right? So it's in a romantic love, because romantic love, uh, they talk about everlasting love. Unfortunately, this love is not. And it is not a love that is bounded by ego. It is not centered by I. It's not the center of the love. Matter is a spiritual practice. It is also to uproot the illusion of isolation. We don't see ourselves as being separate from others. In fact, as we begin to cultivate ourselves, we begin to see ourselves interconnected with, with others. We begin to see all lives as being interconnected. This is what you call interdependent, you know? Uh, and this is the way we begin to look at things. We don't see as ourselves as the center of the world, center of the universe, and everything goes around us. Uh, this, is, this is not the way things really are. We rise above that and begin to see how everything is interconnected. Metta is a taught uh, the practice of friendliness, of peace, of wishing good health to others and ourselves. And there is no attachment or no egotism. And it is a mind that is ready to forgive, or the mind which is ready to ask for forgiveness. And forgiveness is important because um, when we are proud, when we are considered, we do not want to forgive. Yeah? We do not want to ask for forgiveness, and we do not want to forgive. But a loving mind is a mind that is always ready to forgive, because uh, we also realize that we have failings, and so when others have their failings, we are prepared to forgive them. And we are also prepared to ask for forgiveness. And through the practice of matter, we find a reservoir of happiness within. The happiness itself could be generated within. And from this, our good thoughts will flow to others. So it, in today's uh, morning talk, we would just do a little bit of exercise on how we can generate and how can we get in touch with this happiness that lies within us. Now, Meta has some enemies as well. One is what we call enemy within. Have you heard about what you call by enemy within? Enemy within is called last. It is last, huh? and in in order to overcome uh, lust, uh, in the Satipatthana Sutta, this is found in the Diga Nikaya Sutta 22, or the Majjhima Nikaya. Majjhima is Nikaya is the middle length uh, sayings of the Buddha. Sutta number 10, uh, there are remedies on how we can contemplate all the ugliness of the mind. I think um, in the uh, Vishuddhi Magga, uh, which is the path of purification, written by, uh, it's a commentary by uh, Buddha Gosha, he mentioned about how there was this young man on an auspicious day, like today, new moon or a full moon, he went to the temple uh, with the intention to practice metta meditation. So he has taken his eight precepts and all that, all dressed in white, and taken his bath and taken his precepts and all that, and he sat down in med meditation, but obviously his meditation teacher has not given him a proper subject. So when he thinks about, oh, I need to send loving kindness, he begins to think, who can I send it to? And he says, oh, maybe tonight I'll send my loving kindness to my wife. So he sat down and had the image of his wife in the mind and begin to send loving kindness to her, may you be well, may you be happy. And as he begins to contemplate more and more and more on his wife, from loving kindness, he begins to change character. Yeah? 
from that, from from loving kindness, from meta, it becomes lust. And uh, apparently, uh, this young man was so uh, taken up by lust, he was being fired by lust that he wanted to go out of the place that he was in, and he couldn't find the door. <laughs> he was so inflamed with passion that he was banging against the wall. So this is actually mentioned in the Vishuddhi Mark, uh, which is which means to say that although uh, sending uh, loving kindness to somebody whom we are uh, very connected to, uh, romantically connected to, uh, we must actually be careful because eventually that instead of matter, it might actually turn into lust. And uh, so uh, the uh, there are you know in the English language there are three uh, uh, different varieties of of love. I once had a teacher who was giving a talk in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a hall, and uh, one young man stood up, uh, this was at the university, asking, oh, uh, Venerable Sir, you talk about uh, love, you talk about lust, platonic love and universal friendliness. Uh, can you try to demonstrate what it is? So this uh, teacher was saying, okay, can you look around? and see the prettiest girl uh, in this hall. Uh, and of course, he had found his candidate. And the teacher says, have you seen her? He says, yes. And he says, now can you uh, look at her again? So this time around, don't have to look around. You just know where she is and look at her for the second time. And then he says, have you seen her? Yes. And says, can you uh, turn around and look at her for the third time? And he looked at her for the third time. He says, OK, if you want to know what last platonic love and universal friendliness is the first time when you look at her that was universal friendliness the second time is what you call platonic love and the third time is called lust <laughs> well this is a kind of a joke in order to demonstrate the situation uh, but this is only, only to say that sometimes how you know the uh, love that we experience can actually change character uh, platonic love is the kind of love that we have for friends uh, it is not sensual love it's just uh, uh, the love that we have among friends. And uh, so uh, the enemy outside is called ill will, anger, or hatred. So these are the enemies of matter. Matter is the antidote to anger. And when a person is angry and whose mind is disturbed by anger, by hatred, he may resort to do many things, including killing living beings and uh, destroying the happiness of others and himself. Actually, anger is really uh, very dangerous. Uh, you know, um, anger is con considered to be like a fire or a poison inside. It's a destructive emotions. So when we have anger, it is as if you are just holding fire or we have poison. So uh, matter is the antidote to anger and it helps us to purify the mind from defilements. From the Dhammapada verses three and four, it says, you have this verse. He abused me, he beat me, he defeated me, he robbed me. In those who hold on to such thoughts, hatred will not end. He abused me, he beat me, he defeated me, he robbed me. In those who do not harbor such thoughts, hatred will end. We know what is abuse. This is scolding, using malicious words with the intention to hurt. Or beating, which is to harm somebody physically. Defeat is to hit out at another one and prevail over, over them. For instance, being defeated at, at, at any elections, <laughs> the feeling of defeated or defeating somebody at any elections. Or uh, rob uh, to create a sense of loss and deprivation. So these are some ways in which uh, it can lead to anger or hatred. So people um, who harbor such thoughts, uh, they will not, their hatred will, will, will persist. What is the reaction of people when they're angry? It's generally, of course, we dislike the situation or we dislike the person. We have the feeling of aversion. We want to avoid it. We want to destroy it. And there is a feeling of ill will. So it is not a good thing. And you don't feel happy or satisfied. It is like holding on to burning charcoal and you bear a grudge inside the heart. Uh, but there are different types of people. There are some people where even when they have anger, the anger do not last very long, like the letters written in water. Some other people, the anger will last for a little while, 
But then after a while, the anger will disappear. It's like letters written in sand. But there are some people, once they are being hurt, they will always bear it as a grudge. It is like letters written in rock. And uh, when we talk about anger, sometimes we have anger towards ourselves. So it's like what you call self-critique. Now, it is fine uh, to examine ourselves when we have performed some error in order to see what is our weakness and how can we rectify it. It is, all, it is good to have some kind of self-reflection to find our areas of weakness. But we don't have to put ourselves through negative self-criticism. That is, we keep on hopping again and again that error and criticizing ourselves because within our own minds sometimes we do have somebody who <laughs> we have some thoughts that they keep criticizing ourselves our fault which is done so it depends on how you handle yourself do you handle yourself like a friend that is when you have done an error so you say oh i've done an error and then you uh, you know make the resolution not to do it again or are you like another person who keep criticizing yourself again and again saying you know why do you do the error you know that you know using all these um, very negative words and so when a person is self-critical it begins uh, to be negative yeah. uh, we need to see a problem for what it is in our honest equations what can we do about it and to make sure that it doesn't happen again yeah. in a meta meditation uh, we radiate loving kindness to ourselves so when we practice meta we regard ourselves as a friend. You start off with, with your friend. Actually, in matter, we treat ourselves like a vessel of love and kindness. And we generate the love and kindness within ourselves and then let the love and kindness overflow from this vessel so that you can actually reach out to others. And how about anger towards others? Uh, often it is hard to let go of anger. Some people like to keep the grudge in their heart and feel miserable about it because they do not want to forgive. Because they feel, oh, when I forgive, it is as if I'm losing something. So I just want to hold on to the grudge. And also sometimes uh, people who are closest to us are the people that we are most unhappy with. We are most critical about them. Right? And this is when, when sometimes children find their parents almost too critical. And uh, there is uh, cases of uh, children feeling depressed, uh, having go to go to psychiatrists, and even some children committing suicide. Because uh, parents uh, have raised the standards so high that the, the children feel that they are not able ever to achieve them. Yeah. And um, also, uh, the feeling of self-importance, uh, you know, sometimes people, people have, have this self-importance, oh, how could you do this to me, you know, and uh, so they have the anger towards others. Uh, can we learn how to forgive? Can we open up our hearts and let go? So it's actually better to relax rather than to, to, to tighten up. Yeah? Uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, this uh, Anguttara is the numbered sayings of the Buddha, 760. It talks about the wretchedness of anger. Um, you know when you, you're angry, uh, this is uh, the advice of why we should not be angry. When you are angry, it is as if you're helping an enemy. Okay, You're helping an enemy by maintaining the anger in your mind. For instance, uh, does an enemy want you to be ugly or not? Certainly an enemy, an enemy wants you to be ugly. Yeah? And in the Anguttara Nikaya, it says that you are going to be ugly. Even if you're well-groomed, even if you like shave your, yourself and you know, keep, make sure that your hair is well-trained, you maintain yourself very well, dress very well, but you're not going to be good looking with that anger in your face. Yeah? So this is like what an enemy wants you to look like. To be ugly instead of good looking. So by being angry, number one, you're helping your enemy by being ugly. <laughs> number two, your enemy wants you to lie in pain. So when you maintain that anger in your mind, even if you lie in comfort, uh, how can you, what do you think in terms of comfort? Like you lie down in the in the most wonderful, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, mattress and air conditioned room, and everything is wonderful so comfortable but when you have anger in your heart can you lie in, in peace you actually lie in pain despite the fact that yeah your bed and your couch is really so comfortable so you will lie in pain even if you lie in comfort and this is what your enemy wants to happen to you number three you will have no prosperity 
Because when you're angry, you start doing things that cause you to do harm and, and lead, that leads to suffering. So you will have no prosperity when you maintain that anger in your mind. And it is also possible that you lose your wealth through anger. Because sometimes through anger, we take, we are rash, we do things, uh, we make decisions that are, they are not good at all. Because if we have considered things clearly, then we will not have taken that course of action. Uh, because of the rash actions, we lose wealth. And you lose our fame and reputation as well through anger. Because if you're an angry person, everybody wants to avoid you. Uh, you know that actually in the world, sometimes there are, there are certain personalities that, that, are, not, <laughs> that are not loved uh, in many places in the world. Uh, I think uh, some of you would know, uh, yeah, just keeping, keeping in touch with what is happening in the world these days. And you also lose your friends, your companions and relatives. Because if you have the angry person, if they see you coming, they'll just want to run away. They do not want to interact with you because when they interact with you, you'll just be complaining and uh, you just be pouring out your anger. So you lose friends, companions and relationship. And finally, uh, the wretchedness of, uh, it is a seventh uh, uh, point, that after death, rebirth will take place in a bad destination and even in hell. So these are the seven bad things. will actually like to happen to you. Get angry. You are helping an enemy. Uh, so this is from Angotara Nikaya 716. Now let us uh, go on to the practice of metta. Yes. Um, let us uh, have a little uh, practice of metta. Let me just ex explain to you uh, the practice of metta. Um, actually, if you like, you can join us in uh, metta practice every Wednesday at 9 o'clock, 9 p.m that we do online and uh, we will uh, run through this meta practice. Uh, the meta practice, first you send loving kindness to yourself and then sending loving kindness to others. And uh, you make use of four wishes. The first wish is may my heart be peaceful and free. Second wish is may my mind be happy. Third wish may my body be healthy. And the fourth wish is, may I be well and happy. So these are the four wishes that you wish for yourself. And then you use the same wish to others as well. You could say, may your heart be peaceful and free. May your mind be happy. May your body be healthy. May you be well and happy. And these are the four wishes that we use and we rotate in our minds as we practice metta. These wishes will trigger the feeling of loving kindness within our hearts. Now, for those of you who have been following Meta with me, will find that saying these four wishes will not be so difficult because we have been doing this every Wednesday. But for some of you coming into touch with these wishes for the first time, you might be a bit too much to remember in your meditation. So in which case, I think you could just choose one. You can say like, may my heart be peaceful and free, or may I be well and happy, okay? So what we will do now is we just spend a few minutes in, in loving kindness Meta. And then uh, uh, what we do is uh, sit in a comfortable position with your back straight, okay? And uh, right now, uh, just take a few deep breaths in order to bring your mind to a state of balance. Just observe your breath as you breathe in and out. In order to sharpen our mindfulness, let us just be aware of our skull, the crown of our head. Do you feel some sensations there? Can you bring a smile to your skull? Okay. 
A smile is associated with happiness, with love, with kindness. Bring a smile to your scalp. Now be aware of your forehead. You feel some sensations on your forehead. Bring a smile to your forehead. Be aware of your eyes. Feeling some sensations there. Bring a smile to your eyes. Be aware of your cheeks. Smile to your cheeks. Be aware of your throat. Bring a smile to your throat. And your shoulders. Bringing a smile to your shoulders. And your arms right down to your palms and your fingers. Just be aware of your entire arm. And bring a smile to your arms. Bring the relaxation, the love, the kindness down your arms. Be aware of the front part of your body. As you breathe in and out, you will feel some sensations in the front part of your body. Bring a smile to the front part of your body. Now to the back part of your body. Bring a smile there. and now go internal to your internal organs, to your heart. Touch your heart with love and kindness. Bring a smile to your heart. And let the love and kindness from your heart goes to your lungs and goes to the other organs in your body. To your liver, to your spleen, to your pancreas, to your pituitary gland, to your kidneys, and your digestive system, your stomach, your intestines. And moving lower down to the, your seat as you're sitting down to the base of your body. And then be aware of your legs, your thighs, your knees, your calves, right down to the sole of your feet. And bring love and kindness, bring a smile. Now let us send love and kindness first to ourselves. We just make use of one wish. May my heart be peaceful and free. 
thinking of your heart that is peaceful, a heart that is free, that is happy. Let us make the wish, may my heart be peaceful and free. Just keep making the wish, running the wish in your mind. May my heart be peaceful and free. And put us putting a smile in your face, putting a smile in your heart. May my heart be peaceful and free. So now you become a vessel of love and kindness. And now let us send a thought of loving kindness to someone else. Think of someone uh, whom you have high regards, or who uh, is connected to you. Could be a friend, could be a parent, could be a mentor, could be a teacher, just somebody in your mind. Or could be even your brother or sister. But better to choose somebody of your same gender. Now, if you are sending loving kindness to your teacher, you just imagine that your teacher is in your mind and you speak to your teacher from your heart. You say, Teacher, may your heart be peaceful and free. May you be well and happy. If your mind has strayed away, or have wandered away, just take a note of that and drop that thought and return back to your wish. May your heart be peaceful and free. May you be well and happy. And say this with a smile in your heart. Okay, so you can slowly open up your eyes. So that is an example of how we do loving kindness meditation. But of course, in our Wednesday practice, we go through the four wishes. And there are many more people that we send loving kindness to. It's a complete meditation. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we make use of the wish uh, first to ourselves. May my heart be peaceful and free. May my mind be happy. May my body be healthy, may I be well and happy. And matter to others, may your heart be peaceful and free, may your mind be happy, may your body be healthy, may you be well and happy. Now, at first it might sound, it is a bit hard going if you're not used to this method of meditation. But after a while, just saying these wishes itself will trigger that happiness within our mind. So we're conditioning our mind for the happiness and peace. Okay, So this is a good meditation for us to have. And the idea of sending first meditation to ourselves and then to others is uh, to remove the barriers between people. Just as I want happiness and to avoid suffering, also I do, also do other beings. They also want to be happy and they also want to avoid suffering. All right. And in selecting people for our meta practice, we, we practice uh, from the easiest, the people who, whom we have closest connection with and then eventually move on to neutral beings. And then later on, 
when our practice becomes really good, then we can actually go to people whom we do not really like so much. And uh, so we begin with people that is liked, that is admired and respected, and uh, also a dearly beloved companion, uh, but not somebody that you are uh, attracted to because of the problems that I mentioned earlier. And then when we move to the neutral person, you begin to think of a neutral person as a very dear person. And then eventually when you move over to the enemy, you think of the enemy as being neutral, okay? And of course, meta can also be sent into different directions. In the, there, are, there are different ways of practicing meta. So eventually, loving kindness is brought to a point where there is no, no longer a barrier between yourself and the person. So everybody becomes the same. There is no difference between yourself and others. They don't practice the quality of meta. So you have the same wishes of loving kindness for yourself, as, which is equivalent, which is the same as the kind of loving kindness that you send to other beings. Uh, there are two ways of practice. First is you align your thoughts and your actions with Brahma Vihara. Uh, this is having it in your actions and thoughts. And secondly, you can also develop a Brahma Vihara as a meditation objects. And you can even bring this meditation to a very absorption of jhana. It is possible to practice uh, metta up to jhanic stage. Mm -hmm. And of course, the two practices of aligning our thoughts and actions with matter and practicing as a meditation object will reinforce each other. So and you will find that the mind will have less resentment, less tension, rest, irritable. The mind actually becomes happy. When the mind becomes happy, the experiences that you get will also be happy. So the cultivation of uh, states in meditation will make the four Brahma Viharas become more spontaneous and more established in the mind. So uh, your mind becomes almost like a, a divine abiding. And of course, uh, close to the idea of matter is what, what we call empathy. Empathy is being able to put yourself in another person's shoes and to understand what that person might be thinking. So as you develop our loving kindness, our capacity for empathy also increases. And actually, our mind is wired to show empathy. And we feel the pain of the persons that we love, like the pain that the mother feels for the, for the child. Now, I grew up in a family where my mother is a strict, strict parent. My father will not lay off any finger on us. Right? Mother has to raise uh, six children, and she has to do everything herself. So sometimes, as little kids, we were sometimes not so obedient. We were a bit naughty. And she will uh, shout out her warning. And after uh, three warnings, she will come with the cane. So sometimes as little kids, sometimes we uh, feel the cane from the mother in order to discipline us. Of course, this is using a cane is not fashionable. This is not the way to raise kids. But this traditionally, that's how kids are raised and we turn out to be okay. Uh, but when the mother uses a cane, I remember one day the mother was speaking to a friend she says that when she uses a cane for the child, she feels as if her flesh has been cut. So this is to say, you know, this is why we say empathy. You feel when you love a person, uh, when the person that you love, you begin to feel the, the pain of the person and you begin to develop empathy. So when we develop uh, loving kindness, your compassion, your altruistic joy will also increase. Yeah? Uh, we begin to perceive the person to be more like us and we can empathize with the person. And the reflection on empathy is just like you reflect. The person, uh, this is for a person who, who is just like starting out, and it is also this uh, reflection that we can also have, that the person is just like me. He's got a body and mind just like me. Right? Actually, if the world leaders were to think like this, we will have very much less problems in this world. It's only that be, they begin to think that people in the other country are completely different from us. And they are special. Yeah. But if they begin to have empathy, they say, this, the other persons are just like me. They have bodies and minds just like me. Just like me, the body is subject to sickness, will go old and pass away one day. And he needs food to eat, water to drink, and the air to breathe. And he has feelings. He has emotions and thoughts just like me. Just like me, he wants to be healthy. He 
He wants to be valued and loved. And he wants to be happy just like me. So when we have this kind of reflection, it helps us to develop our empathy for others. And we are able to empathize, put ourselves in the other people's shoes and almost be able to second guess what they might, what they are thinking, how they are feeling. There are benefits of matter. Let me go through uh, the benefits of matter. Uh, the Buddha says in uh, Iti Vutaka, Sutta number 27, because, because the Buddha was addressing to monks, he says, whatever kinds of worldly merits there are, whatever types of worldly merits there are in this world, they are not worth one sixteenth part of loving kindness, of loving kindness uh, that is shining, beaming, and radiant, uh, coming out from the heart. Loving kindness excels all these other worldly merits. Yes. So this um, uh, practice of loving kindness will bring you merits 16 times more than whatever worldly merit that you might accumulate. All right. So this is the advice from the Buddha, which shows how highly the Buddha think about the practice of loving kindness. And uh, also, uh, if there was uh, in a sutra, the Buddha mentioned about the 11 benefits of metta. One, three is about sleeping. You sleep in comfort. You wake up in comfort and you don't have nightmares in your sleep. And as far as other people are concerned, other human beings will like you. You are dear to human beings. Also, the non-human beings will also like you. So you are dear to non-human beings as well. And the devas will guide to you. And if you have practiced uh, metta to a deep state, uh, like to the state of jhana, even the fire, poison, and weapons cannot harm you. The practice of metta will condition the mind, will prepare the mind for meditation. So if you have your meditation practices, you will find that your you can concentrate faster if you have the basis of loving kindness practice. And your face will become more serene, more lovely to look at, uh, so radiant, so serene. And uh, the last two is about uh, passing away. Uh, number 10 is a death. Uh, this is something that that all of us will have to pass, will come through one day. Uh, at death, the mind will be peaceful. And when it comes to rebirth, a person who practices metta will be reborn in the Brahma world uh, that is of high divinity. So these are the 11 the benefits of metta that, that was mentioned by the Buddha. Uh, besides the Buddha, there was also a recommendation from the American Heart Society. Can you imagine that the loving kindness meditation has now become so popular in the West that now the American Heart Society in the year 2020, this year, they have released a poster on loving kindness, and there you could see the poster. Uh, because they have uh, true research, they found that mental has positive effects on the heart, on stress management and hypertension, helps you to sleep better, helps you to feel more balanced and connected. So they have recognized the benefit of matter and now trying to promote the practice of matter amongst the uh, amongst the American public. And uh, the method which they propose, if you can see the poster, number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, is exactly coinciding with the Buddhist metta meditation. Right? So this is uh, the endorsement uh, from, uh, uh, from the American Heart Society, from somebody, uh, from people that comes from a non-Buddhist tradition, now recognizing the benefits of loving kindness meditation, that cuts across religious barriers. There's no religious barriers in the practice of loving kindness. Anybody, regardless of religious affiliations, religious uh, of race, of caste, or whatever it is, of nationality, everybody can benefit from the practice of loving kindness. And there has also been research on meditation as well. The research on meditation has shown that it can increase the circuit linking the part of the brain associated with positive emotions. You know, if the mind is negative all the time, you are actually strengthening the, 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 the link of the negative part. Uh, you know, you show the negative part of uh, your, your brains will connect um, the negative part of your brain cells, and therefore you continue to experience negative, negative uh, feelings of stress, of tension. But if you begin to practice the loving kindness meditation, another part of your brain becomes activated. And this part, uh, your circuit for the positive parts will actually be stronger. And that is why when a person practices mental uh, loving kindness meditation, 
they begin to have more and more positive emotions. They begin to see things change for them. And other people will also say, hey, how come you look so different now? You look so radiant, you look so peaceful, so happy. What happened? What, what happened to you? It is through the practice of metta, but it is not just something that just comes from a book or something like that. This has been found from research. They found that the part of the brain, uh, the circuit that links to the part of the brain for the positive emotions have been strengthened. Uh, there is this professor, uh, Richard Davidson, I think from the University of Wisconsin. He has, uh, earlier in his research, had been focusing a lot on negative emotions like, uh, like stress. And, and uh, uh, in America, they like uh, to talk about talking about stress and on, on negative emotions, uh, what they, uh, the impact of negative emotions on the body and all that. And one day, Professor Richard Davidson met up with the Dalai Lama, who suggested to him, why don't you uh, do your research on positive emotions and said, yeah. So he did his uh, research. And one of the uh, research that was done, uh, one whole body of research, was that when a person uh, gets training in compass compassionate meditation, which is also similar to metta meditation, if you do it for 30 minutes, daily for two weeks, you can actually develop a healthy mind. Repeated meditation practice, you can rewire the brain and city. You can completely rewire your brain to have greater awareness and connection, you also have feelings of appreciation, of kindness, of compassion. You see, you can even change the quality of your brain. And uh, Professor Davidson was saying, talking about how there are four things that seem to challenge our well-being. One is distractibility, that people tend to get distracted. This is from their research. Uh, they found that uh, the uh, increase in attention deficit disorder and this is especially amongst children, but not just confined to children alone. And there was a paper that came to the conclusion that a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. So when uh, we do uh, a little bit of our meta practice just now, when we begin to scan the different parts of the body and bring smiles to the different parts of your body, and by so doing, your mind becomes, uh, uh, you know, connected, becomes more directed, becomes more focused, you actually begin to experience happiness in the mind. I think many of you would have experienced just now through the short practice of metta, the feeling of happiness. Because it's a scientific paper that says that when your mind wanders, your mind is an unhappy mind. The more distracted your mind is, the more unhappy it is. The second challenge to well-being is what you call loneliness. Despite being connected with the social media, people feel isolated. And this becomes a serious problem, especially amongst uh, senior people where their children themselves have already uh, gone off uh, either to studies overseas or elsewhere, or even starting uh, have started work and have established their families elsewhere. And they're being left at home in a big house. And that's a problem for loneliness. Very serious problem. In Japan, uh, they also show that people who are past 65, or maybe, you know, sometimes even the spouse has passed away, children are no longer with them. Uh, sometimes they go over to the supermarket to do petty tasks like stealing things, shoplifting, not because they are lack of things, but because they want to be caught and be thrown in jail. They want to do minor crimes to be thrown in jail because in the jail itself, that's where they have their meals, that's where they have company, they have friends. Uh, whereas if they stay at home, they feel very, very lonely. I think this is quite terrible. Okay? Feeling of less. And there is also the third uh, challenge to well-being is the negative self-talk and depression. And there's an increase of depression amongst children, especially between 12 and 17 years old. And also they found that the, the females tends to be more than the males uh, in the, involved in negative self-talk and depression. And this sometimes culminates in suicide. And then also there's another one, which is a loss of meaning and purpose in life. Okay? And so these are all uh, serious problems that is occurring in developed countries. Uh, you know, when you have time in their hands, uh, these are the problems that they have, okay? Now, through the research in uh, neuroscience, it actually shows the efficacy of uh, mindfulness and meditation. That it found that mindfulness and meditation training can help to rewire the mind, the brain, through neuroplasticity. So they use the MRI scanner on a randomized, randomized group of people practicing compassionate training for two weeks for 
30 minutes per day, not, not long, yeah, 30 minutes per day, you just do it for 14 days. And actually the MRI shows that the neural linkage has actually become stronger within the uh, prefrontal cortex and the ventral striatum of the brains. And these are important for positive emotions. So, so there are also this diagram at the front part of the brain, yeah, the, it, gets, it gets connected, eh? the linkage gets connected. And this is the linkage that is connected, it does linkage is stronger, that means you tend to have more positive emotions. So this can actually address the negative emotions that challenges well-being. The other thing which they found was that when you do a, a meditation, your brain becomes younger. And this comes from the research from uh, Sarah Lazar. Uh, she was uh, from Harvard University. She found that meditation is extremely effective for decreasing stress and enhancing our ability to pay attention and to be happy. So she did uh, some research and found that meditators in the 50 years age group, that means people who are quite senior, uh, these meditators, when they look at the amount of the gray matter that is in the brains, the amount, the density of the gray matter is equivalent to people who are 25 years old. So in other words, you might be 50 years old, but if you have been practicing meditation, your gray matter's density will be equivalent to your son's <laughs> brain dance five years old. Here's some, some, uh, some gra graphs which they have come up with. And uh, several areas of the brains of meditators are also more developed, including the left hippocampus. Uh, this is the part that helps you in learning, uh, in memory, and in emotional regulation. So when you practice meditation, you also learn better your memory also becomes stronger, yeah? You don't become so forgetful. And your emotion become more balanced. You become more equanimous, yeah? more, more balanced, and less up and down. And the brain region above the ear, which is uh, associated with empathy and compassion, also becomes more developed amongst meditators. So this is the research that have, they have actually come up about meditation. Okay, this is the, the, some diagrams to show. That as you begin to do more meditation, you develop more gray matter in the uh, prefrontal cortex of your brain. Okay. And this is uh, Sarah Lazar's research. Okay. Now, if you look at this, uh, red dots. Red dots are the control. That is people who don't do meditation at all. And these are the years. You know, 25 years old, you have got thickness of your, the density of your gray matter is high. Right. So at 25 years old, people who are 30 years old and as, they get older, the brain density becomes less and less, less thick, right? So by 50 years old, you are expected to have uh, the density about like 1.7, uh, 1.8. But see what is happening to the meditators. Meditators are the blue dots. You see, there is there doesn't seem to be any difference between the meditators who are in the age of 50 compared to meditators who are age, age 25. Look at the gray matter. It's almost consistent. So in other words, this is to say, that when you do meditation, your brain actually remains young, remains useful. So you become less forgetful, you become more alert, you can learn better, you can remember better. And that is really wonderful, isn't it? Yeah? And this is the lab hippocampus. We were mentioning about how hippocampus, when this is, becomes more developed, it exceeds learning and memory and also the regulation of your uh, the uh, emotions. And uh, if you have less gray matter, it is associated with depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, now this is a control. This is the amount of uh, density, brain density that you have amongst people who don't do meditation. These are the people who have done a meditation program under the MBSR, but uh, it means eight weeks of doing meditation for 30 minutes and see the density in the lab hippocampus. Even for a short period like that, your brain itself could actually regenerate cells which is quite amazing. And also that uh, temporal uh, parietal junction, this is the part of empathy. This is just above your ears. Eh? And uh, for the control system, actually it's negative. So they're not very, very empathetic. But those who are practicing meditation, they become very, uh, very good in their feeling of compassion and empathy. Uh, look at the difference. Eh? Okay, so this is only to say, that even as we talk about the blessings of, of doing meta, the benefits of it, 
and uh, you know the advice that the Buddha has given on how metta itself, uh, the practice of uh, the Brahma Viharas, uh, brings uh, tremendous merits to us. Yeah? Uh, it, this is not being validated by scientific research. Now let me just go uh, fairly quickly on how do we use metta for daily practice. We know that love has a power to open hearts and reduce barriers. And let us look at all things with love. When we get up, when we look around nature, be glad that we are alive. Enjoy the sun, enjoy the rain, enjoy the light and enjoy the darkness. Look at everything with almost like a, the, the, expectant, uh, the expectation of a child. Remember when you were a child? Everything looks so wonderful. Uh, have that kind of that happiness of a child, looking at everything with love. And when we speak, we speak with love. Even the, our enemies, we can praise them. And we find an excuse to say good things rather than to blame. And you find that as you begin to say good things to people, even if they're not happy with you, when the words get to them, uh, you will see that they will also begin to change about the way they, they look at you. Right? That, it, does, it does have a strong effect. Right? So we act with love and kindness. And also the practice of five precepts is, is one aspect of practicing love. Right? The first, uh, first uh, precept is to uh, practice all so that you don't kill. Second is to respect all beings, you know, uh, so you, you don't steal and have that contentment with your loved ones, so no adultery. Fourth is talking with truth, truth is saying things that are beneficial and timely, that maybe uplift the hearts, make people happy. Uh, but it must be truthful and it must be suitable uh, to the situation. And um, also we, when we react with others, please react with kindness and with love. Uh, use kindness and love as a way of interacting with others. At your mind level you wish, may you be well, may you be happy as you interact. Uh, and you send out good thoughts, vibrations, and even the plants and animals can sense them. There are some research, I think, uh, about plants, uh, tomato plants. <laughs> they have two pots of, uh, two uh, patches of tomato. One part, they play music and they have good thoughts on the tomato. Tomato seems to grow very well. Another part, they think of pulling out the plants and uh, tomatoes are not growing well and they look with it. So apparently even plants can sense our mental vibrations. There's some research, but I do not know. Uh, you know, whether uh, those research have been validated, but it's quite interesting. But certainly animals can sense us. Yeah. So have uh, good thoughts. Our environment can sense us when we have good thoughts. Learn to love yourself. Yes. Learn to love yourself. Be mindful of your actions. Be mindful of your speech and thoughts. And don't overindulge in your senses. Even if you want to enjoy, don't enjoy so much that it makes you sick. <laughs> Learn to love yourself. Be mindful. And then send out your love to all beings, and humans as well as non-humans. This is part of the Buddhist tradition. After doing something meritorious, we always share merits. Metta is also loving acceptance. That means we become non-judgmental. Yeah? We have an open acceptance to, or to, people, uh, to people on the present moment. We recognize people for their strength as well as their weakness, and we accept them without value judgment. And people feel comfortable for us if we have this kind of attitude, recognize a person for his Buddha nature, that even the person who doesn't seem to do very well at all, inside him has a potential for Buddhahood. He's got a Buddha nature. All right? So this is, it is a good practice to have, to think like that. Uh, I can give one example. There was one story about this monk, this monk who was doing his chanting in a monastery. And when he was doing his chanting, a thief came in, armed with a knife and all that, uh, but it, that, that, the thief didn't uh, distract the monk at all. The monk continued chanting, and the thief will start looking for things and saw some money, you know, some money inside the drawer. And um, as the thief was taking the money, the monk shouted to the thief, don't take everything because I have to pay taxes. I think this is in Japan, the monks also have to pay taxes. <laughs> and after the thief left some behind, uh, and just before he was leaving the monastery, the monk says, after you, you have taken the something, what must you say? So the thief says, oh, thank you. Okay, 
and the monk continued chanting. Now, a few days later, the thief was caught. And then among some of the people whom he stole with was actually at this monastery. So this monk was, was called forward to say, uh, you know, as, as one of his, uh, to, to give his uh, testimony. And he says that he considered consider this man not a thief uh, because the thief, uh, you know, he's given permission to the, for the thief to take the money. And the thief also said, thank you. So after a short imprisonment, this thief uh, came back to the monastery and actually became a disciple of the monk. <laughs> this is quite tremendous, a story of how when you practice kindness, a yeah, person sometimes become a thief because of, because of needs, uh, sometimes he has to feed his family. Yeah. But suddenly somebody recognized something beautiful inside him, and therefore he comes back to the monk again to accept the monk as his teacher. A second person that I like to talk about is uh, Catherine. You know, I studied in Bristol for my PhD, and I was very fortunate that uh, in the whole of Britain, you don't have many places where you can practice meditation. So in Catherine's house, they have a, uh, they have a small meditation group. Uh, and uh, we meet in the house every Wednesday. And sometimes I can even walk from where I was staying to Catherine's house. Uh, but Catherine is a very fiery English lady. Hmm? Very fiery, red hair, very fiery. And she loves her father, whom she had so much admiration for. But she doesn't like the mother because the mother seems to irritate her so much. But later on, the father died. Left with the mother. And she also began to realize maybe she should, she should actually reconcile and maybe, uh, you know, uh, begin to uh, reconcile with the mother because she's the only parent that, that was left for her. Uh, Catherine is single, actually. Then uh, one day when we went to her house for, for practice, uh, Catherine was happy she was very elated and she says you know what my mother has given to me uh for, for christmas she has given me a beautiful buddha image so apparently the mother managed to find a beautiful buddha image the mother was not even a buddhist at all but knowing that catherine was uh, attracted to buddhism got her a beautiful buddha image i thought that was a very beautiful story okay so these are examples on how when you begin to practice loving kindness and matter how things can actually change So uh, having the loving acceptance of the present moment and using the energy of mindfulness to experience fear, pain, grief, anger, sadness, separation, frustration, and happiness. It doesn't mean that when you practice metta that everything is going to be perfectly happy. But sometimes even when negative things happen to you, you can also use mindfulness in order to experience, experience the unhappy uh, occurrence. And it is important for us to touch the seeds of peace inside. And this is what I learned from Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh. We have the seeds of love, of peace inside us. Touch that inside. Don't touch the seeds of war, of pain, of despair that's also inside us. Touch the happy seeds, seeds of love, seeds of peace within us. Even when we experience unhappy uh, occurrences. And um, when we are anxious, experience, recognize the anxiety in the mind. Recognize that it is actually natural and radiate living kindness to it. And when the anger arises, it is natural to feel uneasy when anger arises. So instead of fighting or denying, you just recognize anger. And this is a very powerful technique of being mindful of your mental state. Very often when we are angry, the anger pulls us along. We get dragged into a hole almost like beyond our control. But if you practice mindfulness, you can almost like delink from that, almost like stand aside and watch the mental state of anger. And when you recognize it, you are no longer subject to be pulled by that anger. You seem to have some kind of independence, the ability to act separate from that anger. So then it is possible to have loving kindness. Oh, loving kindness occurs twice. Having loving kindness to that anger. Uh, there was a case of... Uh, mentioned by Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh about how when he was a young Vietnamese monk, he had a small team of uh, monks working with him. This was during the, the, the Vietnam War, right? And he was in Saigon. And uh, there was this, uh, one of his disciples, a, Vietnam, a Vietnamese uh, monk, was walking in the streets uh, of uh, Saigon. And then he felt something wet on top of his head. And then when he looked up and felt it, he he knew that it was a spittle 
An American soldier was standing on the truck and had just spat on the head of the monk, and this American soldier was laughing at him. And that actually infuriated him so much. He was so angry that when he uh, spoke with uh, Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, he says that he wanted to stop becoming a monk. He wants to disrobe. He wants to join the uh, the Viet Cong in order to kill the Americans. You know, the kind of anger that people have when somebody does this to us. But Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh was saying to him uh, that actually when you look at this monk, this monk also doesn't want to be in Saigon. He wants to be in his family in America. He wants to actually enjoy the family. Why does he want to come over to Saigon to fight a war that's not his? And with the risk of him being mean or being killed. And when the Vietnamese, the young Vietnamese man begin to realize that these US soldiers have just spat on him, it's no different from him. They are both human beings wanting the same thing, wanting the same happiness. From that anger, it changed into compassion. And this Vietnamese man, young Vietnamese man, didn't, didn't uh, disrupt. In fact, what he did was he went on cycling to villages to help the villages uh, that was devastated by the Vietnam War. This was a painful history during the Vietnam War. But I think the good story here is that how, uh, you know, uh, when we have begin to have love and kindness, our reaction is completely different compared to when we begin to have anger. And how that anger itself could turn into compassion once we begin to completely different point of view. The, when we have anger, Venerable Thich Nhat says, it's like holding a child. Like holding a child. Huh? He says, water the good seeds in us. And when we water the good seeds, it gives us the capacity to handle the anger that arises in the midst. And we need the energy of mindfulness to embrace the anger, like the way a mother holds a child. You know, when a child is irritated, and when we hold the child and breathe in and out calmly, and encourage the child to do the same, the child will come down. So that is the same with our anger as well. We embrace our anger, be mindful, and we breathe in calmly, like what we did just now during our meditation, we breathe in calmly, and our anger will come down, like the way the child will come down. Hmm? So we must be open to tensions and mental states as they arise, but we must also have the attitude of forgiving, of softening, of allowing, of relaxing, and not of pushing away, not clinging. So we open the heart instead of closing the heart. Right? Because when we begin to push states, mental states that we like, it actually becomes stronger and it begins to grab us. It begins to cling on us. So, but if we have the attitude of being watching it, of forgiving, of softening, of allowing, of relaxing, then we are no longer choked with anger, no longer choked with jealousy or vengeance. It is the kind of loving acceptance that clear our heart from being clogged. And uh, about metta meditation, metta in daily life, apply metta in whatever we do. When, like eating, chewing, bathing, walking, waiting. Uh, we have these days waiting people will use a handphone. Huh? You use your handphone to check your WhatsApp. <laughs> but actually, you should actually use more metta. So when you have wet metta, uh, and in all the activities that we do, your mind itself will be filled with, with loving kindness. Uh, so even if you don't have time to sit down for meditation, just observe how many times your mind is on metta and for how long. And whatever situation that you meet, let metta be your guide. Yeah? And especially when you're talking to an angry person, it is so easy to be reactive to his anger. Take note of his anger and radiate loving kindness to him. And soften your face. Soften your thoughts of matter. Make it the first thought and the last thought of the day. So maybe in closing, let me just share a little story that was uh, told to us by Arjun Brown. He has a devotee in Perth uh, who, had, who has been working on a contract for many, many months because this client in London is so difficult, so nitty gritty. So she had to fly in order, in order to finalize the, the contract. She had to fly all the way from Perth to London. So it was a very long trip, long trip. And when she arrived in London, everybody was saying, wow, the, the boss is very nasty. Everybody's terrified of him. He's very difficult to work with. And when she landed in the office, she came early, you know, uh, earlier than the, and, uh, than the appointed time. So she was shown the meeting room where she sat down and did some meditation. 
some meta meditation. So she reading, radiating loving kindness, radiating loving kindness. And when, after doing radiation, sending loving kindness, uh, the boss actually came to the room, right? And when the judge boss saw her doing meditation, look at her, and she opened her eyes and looked at like him. The first thing that struck her about the boss was because he got beautiful blue eyes. Oh, he says he got such beautiful blue eyes like Jack, my little boy. <laughs> so <laughs> I think the boss was completely disarmed. <laughs> and uh, after the meeting is over, everybody is like waiting outside the meeting room. They say, what happened? Was he really nasty? Did he like just tear the contract apart? He says, no, he was so nice. And he signed the contract. Uh, this is to say the power of loving kindness. This this uh, uh, this uh, lady who was not able to get uh, the contract signed, suddenly meeting a boss who was so difficult, everything completely changed because she was like uh, just practicing meta, radiating meta to him, completely changed. And that is what meta can do to your life. So as I was saying at the start, that the way we interact with the world. The way that we influence the world, the world that we experience, the world actually comes from the mind. So it is very important to condition the mind in a very positive way. And a very good way is to surround yourself with Brahma Viharas, with the four Brahma Viharas, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upeka. Loving, compassion, appreciative joy. And uh, so with that, I end this talk. So uh, I think we have time for question and answer. Thank you, Dr. Sri, for the very well-researched uh, talk on Meta. It, Dr. Sri is truly an uh, authority on Meta. I see uh, research from scientific angles, from the uh, his own practice for the past 23 years in leading Meta and BGF. 